if you're running your infrastructure in the cloud these days, you can get a lot done using some fairly basic cloud services as building blocks to design more advanced systems. This talk is going to show how we used AWS services like EC2 Lambda and the Systems Manager service to build a great fully automated management stack for Elasticsearch infrastructure in Intercom. But before we start, a little bit of introduction. I'm Andrei Blagojevich. I'm a senior software engineer on Intercom's data storage team. As the team name suggests, we are responsible for the Intercom's data storage layer, which includes a gamut of storage technologies from Intercom's relational and non-relational databases to our caching layer and more. Also, one of the key pieces of our ownership scope is our search stack, powered by Elasticsearch at its core, which is going to be the topic of my today's talk. What is Intercom and what do we do? Intercom is one of the world's leading conversational support platforms used by more than 30,000 companies and more than a billion of their customers around the globe, with some prominent names using us, including Amazon, Facebook, Shopify, and more. Uh, our customers get the feature-rich uh, business-to-customer messenger. They can integrate into their web presence and backed by a, a feature-rich SaaS platform, which allows them to manage the complex workflows of their customer support, sales, uh, and marketing teams. As a SaaS company, we have a few engineering principles that we hold dear to our heart. The main one is that shipping is our company's heartbeat. Software is only valuable when you ship it to customers. So we are striving that our engineers are as enabled as possible to ship quality features fast with the underlying infrastructure enabling them to put their full focus on the feature rather than on infrastructure problems. The infrastructure should be the enabler and not the drawback. Product teams in Intercom are structured in a way that they own their infrastructure resources and the infrastructure teams are tasked with building mechanisms to abstract complexities of those resources away, as well as owning critical hot parts of Intercom architecture. For this reason, Intercom has chosen to run exclusively on the cloud and offload as much of the engineering toil of running infrastructure. This is guided by our engineering principle of being technically conservative or running less software, as how we would call it, by relying on AWS compute and storage services as reusable building blocks. Among many examples are MySQL relational databases run on battle-tested cloud services like the AWS Aurora platform, our distributed queues, uh, we rely on AWS Info Queuing Service, AWS Elastic Cache, Power Store Caching Infrastructure, and so on. All of these are services where infrastructure itself is abstracted away, and this allows product teams to spend as least as possible on infrastructure maintenance and as much as possible on customer-facing feature. But as a certain American humorist from the first part of the 20th century funnel equipped, every rule has an exception, except the rule itself. No matter how much you invest in and how much you make sure your company adheres to certain principles, there is going to be an exceptional case which you have to handle separately. Now, in an ideal world, you'd still want to bring that uh, case at least as close as possible back to those principles that you have as a company if you, in reality, can't make it adhere to them. For Intercom, this case ended up being our large search stack. Our clusters run on the order of hundreds of nodes and store more than 200 billion customer documents. We require high-performance SSD storage, which sometimes needs to be tweaked at the lower level of the stack, such as specific rate configuration, use of arcane things like trimming, tweaking block sizes, and other. Across all of them, these clusters need to handle peaks of about half a million to a million search queries per second and tens of thousands of document ingestions per second. Some of our high volume use cases also require indices with significant large mappings. Our personal record is a mapping that contains more than 200,000 fields, including nested ones. This huge mapping powers Intercom's user service, which is part of Intercom, which allows companies to tag and search their user base using any of the thousands of custom tags. Our other use cases for Elasticsearch vary from one end of the spectrum to another. We partition our clusters uh, based on function. And so Elasticsearch aggregations power our real-time customer reports. Um, we do full text search and customer conversations, help articles and messages. As I mentioned already, Elasticsearch backs the platform's functionality to come from customer records tagged with custom data attributes. And finally, it assists in helping our chatbots curate customer support answers and apply machine learning to offer relevant automated ones. 
At the time when we started building the first foundations uh, of our search stack, there were no hosted Elasticsearch platforms available. But even now, for the reasons of scale complexity and the need for fine-grained dials to control the performance of these search clusters, you realize that it will be hard to get this from any of the currently existing hosted Elasticsearch operations, either due to performance, inflexibility, or data protection requirements. We had to bite our tongue, so to speak, and implement a solution of our own, contrary to what we would like to do in a perfect world. We decided to don't stray too far from our principles and build a platform that would be as easy to maintain as possible and whose internals should be abstracted away from product teams as possible. This led us to a guiding principle we used in system design. To the product teams, the solution has to look like a hosted platform. So we went out and set a few goals that such an internally hosted platform should support. First and foremost, teams should be able to create the cluster with the click of a button or run off a command line after specifying a set of desired configuration parameters, such as number of client, master, and data nodes, whether they want a Kibana node or not, types of EC2 instances they want to run on, availability zones, and more. Secondly, the platform should take automated care about some of the most expensive operations you can have on an Elasticsearch cluster. The costliest of those in terms of engineering time spent is certainly making sure that your infrastructure is up to date with the latest security patches. This is the type of work that frequently occurs in infrastructure maintenance and definitely one that has almost nothing to do with the actual workings of your product, uh, beyond, of course, the fact that it makes your product safe, uh, but not in the terms of features offered to customers. Time spent on it can kind of be considered as a dead time for product facing features. Third and fourth goals are more directly related to the product team's needs. In order to be able to use the latest set of Elasticsearch features, you want to have an easy way to follow the version updates and to make sure your clusters have enough capacity to serve your customers, you want to be able to do both vertical and horizontal scaling depending on the nature of your performance bottlenecks. So how do you go on and build your own cloud? Well, let's first get back to a small bit of theory. Every managed storage cloud needs to have two components, a control plane and a data plane. What are these for? A data plane is part of the cloud that contains the actual Elasticsearch nodes. It is responsible for things like the setup of hardware and the installation of the Elasticsearch stack on the nodes, things like disk configuration, Java and Elasticsearch installation, maybe setup of monitoring or logging services and more. Furthermore, it should allow for configuring the Elasticsearch service with correct set of initial parameters for the node type in question, but also importantly, it should allow for easy dynamic reconfiguration of all of the above. When your Elasticsearch node hosts terabytes of data, you want to avoid having to replace the node just to prop another one with different configuration because this requires shifting all this data somewhere else and then back onto the new node, which takes time and resources. It's important to note that while the general cloud guidance would be to treat your service like a disposable asset, it does not always make the pragmatic sense to do so, especially when the price of node recreation is high. Finally, data planes should be partitioned for fault tolerance with shard replicas located on separate fault domains for maximum availability. The data plane is what serves our customer facing requests, so performance and availability are, of course, uh, a must. Now, for our data plane, we decided to utilize a combination uh, of AWS EC2 Compute Infrastructure Service and a configuration management software called Chef. Uh, our data plane runs on hundreds of EC2 instances uh, with our own Amazon machine images. Uh, however, the configuration of each node is further managed by Chef. Chef configurations allow us to fine tune things like critical SSD parameters, install the Elasticsearch stack, but also make sure the right kind of configuration is pushed to right Elasticsearch clusters and node types. Chef also supports running configuration scripts, which are called recipes in Chef parlance, that can dynamically reconfigure a node. For example, we can add a recipe that temporarily stops an Elasticsearch service, remounts the SSD in a different configuration while keeping all the data, and starts the service back up without the need to destroy the node and get another one created with the desired configuration. Okay, so that was our data plane. So let's go back to the original time. The second part of the architecture is the control plane. What is this one about? A control plane manages more complicated Elasticsearch node orchestration workflows. For example, if a cluster needs to undergo a rolling version upgrade, the control plane is the one that needs to schedule and execute it on the nodes in sequence. Application of software patches is the same. Is also responsible for cluster and node creation, although things like post boot configuration are handled by the data plane. And the control plane should also allow for control change in the number of nodes. 
control plane code should be as any other production code, well tested and integrated into uh, continuous integration and continuous deployment pipelines. This ensures that accidental bugs do not compromise the stability of the plane as much as possible. And finally, for us, one of the major requirements was for the control plane physical footprint to be as low as possible. After all, to stay true to our principles, we needed to avoid uh, uh, additional infrastructure that needed to be managed as much as possible. Now, before we jump into details of the control plane, I want to make a quick segue into two seemingly simple Elasticsearch mechanisms that underpin all operations of the control plane on the Elasticsearch nodes themselves. Both of them relate to cluster routing allocation settings. First one disables any shard reallocation in the cluster while on. It's called cluster routing allocation enabled. This is useful for scenarios where a single node has to be taken out for temporary operations like security patching or Elasticsearch version upgrades. Uh, enabling this puts the shards uh, on the uh, enabling this puts the shards on the node into unassigned states uh, if the service goes down, and gives cluster some spare time to complete the maintenance operation. Once the operation is complete and the service is started, the setting is turned back on. The second setting, which is the cloud cluster routing allocation exclude, allows the cluster to exclude a particular node from allocation permanently. Here, the example is given for excluding by IP which is the mechanism we use, but it's also possible to exclude by node name and other means. Uh, this causes any shards from the node to be reallocated elsewhere. In effect, this drains the node of shards and the node can then be safely stopped and replaced. This is crucial in cluster operations like upgrading a node to a BFR EC2 instance or moving the node to a different availability zone and so on. Back then to the control play requirements and most importantly, the final one, the footprint one, which led us to choosing a combination of two serverless technologies for running our control plane. One of them is called the AWS Systems Manager service, and the other one is called the AWS Lambda service. Both of these services do not require any additional infrastructure on our part to run. AWS Systems Manager is a relatively unknown, well, at least compared to other household AWS service names, a hosted infrastructure control service which works by operating an agent on every EC2 node. Apart from Elasticsearch, uh, we also have extensive use of this service in Intercom on other things, such as our deployment systems. Uh, the SSM agent, which the service runs on every node, can be tapped to execute arbitrary shell scripts on the node itself. This coupled with the fact that Elasticsearch APIs are available from any node, led to a solution where there are no external hosts needed to power the control plane. Furthermore, when you write the script executing a particular action against the Elasticsearch API, this script will be talking to localhost, thus reducing massively any network latency or reliability problems. On top of this, the systems manager has a simple mechanism of being able to target nodes based on their tags. So you can tell it to only target nodes, say, from a particular availability zone. Presto, you suddenly have a solution which can do a safe rolling procedure on the cluster while being aware of fault domains. And finally, a systems manager has a concept of cron-like maintenance windows. You can set up a particular recurring maintenance operation like security patching to occur only during predefined times of the day or of the week, for example, in off-peak hours when any production disruptions are minimized. Now, while AWS systems manager distributed nature makes the solution reliable, the fact that it is lacking a centralized execution point and the code has to run on nodes themselves precludes us from doing any destructive operations in the cluster. While stopping an Elasticsearch process, for example, is very much possible and easy to do from a shell on the node itself, operations like deleting a node are not. Now step in the AWS Lambda service. This is an event-driven serverless cloud computing platform, which also does not require hosting any infrastructure ourselves to execute the code. Hooking up a few SQS queues to a Lambda function that can do these offline destructive processes in the cluster, however, solves this problem either. So how does our system look in practice? Let's look at an example of a common operation our systems manager automation does almost every week, which is security patch. This is a high level architecture of our control and data plans. In red is the code deployment part. We keep the code for the scripts that interact with Elasticsearch APIs in a dedicated GitHub repo, and our suite of continuous integration tests runs on every check-in. The code is deployed to an S3 bucket, and the systems manager commands themselves 
pull the latest code and run before executing any scripts. The scripts in our case are written in Ruby, but SSM is language agnostic. SSM commands on Linux EC2 hosts are simple bash script wrappers that can run an arbitrary command line on the node shell. The Ruby scripts themselves then call into various Elasticsearch APIs uh, for the purpose of the maintenance operation itself, uh, like checking the state of the cluster, setting shard allocation settings based on the nature of the maintenance scenario, safely stopping or starting the Elasticsearch service, and more. We make the logic of each script follow a set of immutable guardrails. Before executing an operation on an Elasticsearch node, every script should first make sure that cluster health is green and that the cluster health is green upon completion of the script. This simple set of checks save us, saves us from having any issues during the upgrade that can compromise the stability of data in the cluster. All of our charts have at least one replica located on a different uh, node in a different fault domain in the cluster, which guarantees that the failure of a single node cannot bring the cluster down. If the cluster is healthy, each script then proceeds to exclude the node from shard allocation, either temporarily or permanently as shown before, so it can safely perform the maintenance operation. Any destructive cluster operations like node decommissioning are enqueued before the script exits and handed over to the Lambda functions themselves. For regularly executing commands like security patching uh, in this instance, we set up periodic maintenance windows to execute the commands on a given cluster at a given maintenance time. The command and maintenance window definitions uh, are also kept uh, in a code repository called Terraform, which is an infrastructure as code platform, which allows us to have auditable peer reviewable code of the commands themselves, in addition to the GitHub uh, review process uh, for the underlying uh, execution scripts. Every maintenance window uh, targets clusters and their fault domains based on dynamically set tags. The most commonly used tags for nodes are the cluster name and the, no the node belongs to and the availability zone or the fault domain uh, that the node is in. Security patching would, for example, have different maintenance windows for different fault domains uh, implemented in this way. In one set of the towers, we would patch a single fault domain uh, of a cluster, uh, followed by in another uh, maintenance window targeting uh, a second full domain of the cluster, and so on and so on. Uh, in SSM, every command or maintenance window run produces a nice output of command executions per node, including things like start and stop times, the status of each command, and allows us to drill down into the execution logs uh, and the script logs uh, themselves. Those logs can be stored in S3 or can be integrated into other uh, logging and monitoring solutions such as CloudWatch, for example. Finally, we hook the whole platform into our monitoring dashboards and into Slack, which we use for intercompany communication for the purpose of informing teams on upcoming maintenance moves. Here, we see a typical Elasticsearch cluster health example, while nodes are temporarily taken down for security patching. Pairs of vertical pinkish lines uh, represent the time when the patch command started and when the patch command finished. As the cluster was told to disable shard reallocation during uh, the operation and the shards went into an assigned state, the cluster briefly went into yellow while the kernel patching was being performed on the Elasticsearch uh, node and the service itself was stopped. Once the service starts back up, the number of unassigned shards drops back to zero and the cluster goes back into green state before the operation restarts on the next node. Now, it is important to note here that this specific example applies only for data nodes of the cluster. Patching ingestion only or master nodes in this way does not require stopping shard relocations as these nodes do not host any data. So finally, let's look back and concluding this talk, see what were the major wins that we achieved with this system. First of all, it is the fact that these simple blocks allowed us to build an entirely serverless control plane with very, very little extra cost required to run these rather large data planes. We still have to pay, pay the price of maintaining the code of the platform itself, but that is quite small compared to having to manage additional control infrastructure. In terms of operational events, when major kernel vulnerabilities like zombie load uh, or back in time spectrum meltdown hit the Linux world, you could just shrug off the cost of the fix. It will be picked up automatically by maintenance windows from the kernel repos and applied safely node by node without us having to do any additional steps. Updates of uh, Elasticsearch uh, versions are also greatly simplified. 
once the application code is ready for a new minor or major version of Elasticsearch, we can just kick off a command to do a rolling upgrade, upgrading a node by node in a safe manner. Uh, our product teams are now enabled to easily do cluster resizing uh, and cost optimization themselves. And all the time we have the low level fine dials required to support the heavy use case or Elasticsearch clusters are exposed. And so with that last slide, I want to thank you for your attention and allow some time for any questions.